Um, it's nice to actually be here because I, nowadays with the modern technology, I can join you. I've watched a service from last week. So greetings to those who are at home on the camera and who are watching the service during the coming week. And I thank you for having me um, join you. Uh, I am uh, coming with two aims. One is to do a bit of a mission report. Uh, and I've got a couple of hats to share about that mission report. And then I want to open up um, God's word to have a, some thoughts from the book of Ruth. But um, I really want to thank you because this church has been uh, a financial and prayerful supporter of my ministry with SU and other things for many years. So um, I'm very grateful to be able to come and update you on what God's been doing in my little part of the world. Um, and a thank you for your investment in God's work beyond uh, the walls of your church, not only through your prayers, um, but also through your resources. So, so I'm going to be talking about three hats that I wear. They're interlinked, um, they sort of complement, uh, but hopefully it'll make a bit of sense as to how um, God's currently drawn my ministry that has changed over the various years. So some of it you may be familiar with if you've known about having heard, heard me share before, um, but some of it might be new. Uh, so can I open, I'll pray, um, and then we'll, I'll, I'll share some of this stuff. Lord, thank you so much for your body of Christ. I thank you that... Um, uh, right this moment, around this country, around this city, our churches, our bodies of Christ, are the greater body of Christ coming together to worship you. Lord, uh, being a guest in this church and yet knowing that these, these um, different locations are all having our hearts and our minds focused on you is so heartwarming. This idea that we are a body, that we are a family, and that when we come to new gatherings, we join another expression of your body. So, Lord, thank you for the ministry that, that happens here. Thank you for the ministry that happens because of here. And I thank you for uh, the chance to share and to learn together. May you move amongst us to challenge and enrich and encourage uh, our, our love for you and our service for you. And may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. So the three hats I'm going to share. The first one is my main one, and that's the work I do with Scripture Union. Um, so Scripture Union is now, um, it's no longer Scripture Union Queensland. It used to be seven states and territories, eight states and territories, but it's now, as of a year ago, is now an, a nationally merged organisation. So um, that's the new noodles, bowl of noodles logo that we talk about. It used to be a lamp, but it is still is a lamp, but it's an artistic version of a lamp that's, that we joke looks like a bowl of noodles. But um, my job at SU and the role that I play nationally is thinking about culture. So my role is to think about how do we uh, engage our first Australian peoples? Um, how do we work in first Australian settings? How do we serve the first Australian church? How do we become more effective at, at our Christian mission amongst Indigenous people? Um, also with the multicultural church, which is strong and vibrant. Um, there is some view at the moment that the multicultural church, so the non-white, non-European background church, it won't be long before there are as many of them as there are of white European origin Christians in this country. So it's a big, vibrant part of the Australian Christian community. Um, and so my role is to try and build the bridges between SU and that church community, and then all forms of intercultural and even interfaith mission. That's the, the role that I play nationally. Um, so some of the reasons for that are some of these stats. You might have seen... Uh, about two weeks ago, the Australian Census came out with results from 2021. Uh, so some of them, the headlines were that it's, we are a fast-changing, growing and culturally diverse land. Um, and the challenging thought is that we are now what could be called a, ma a uh, majority migrant nation. So now, increasingly, Australia is becoming culturally diverse. And some of the ways that is seen is that um, the population has doubled in 50 years. So um, I think about when I was born, that, that's not far off that. And the idea that this country has changed that much in such a short period of time is incredible. But now just over half the population was either born overseas or one of their parents were. So within a generation, within two generations, Australia has transformed from being a, a country with an indigenous history and a colonised majority population and now it is a country that has people from all around our world that are here. 22% um, of the country speak another language at home and 850,000 people don't speak English well. That's a huge proportion uh, of our country 
Um, and that is a, a feature that we have made it possible for these people to come and form new lives here, to serve uh, in our economy, in our country, and many to come to worship God here. Um, and yet this is the changing landscape of our land. So how do we do Christian ministry as churches? How do we, how does SU function when they're the sort of young people that we're facing in our communities and in our schools? Um, another statistic is that China is now the fifth most common ancestry after uh, British, the British Isles, so English, Scotland, Wales and Ireland. Um, and 5.5% of the Australian population comes from Chinese origins. And the Christian community amongst that proportion is very big and strong. Uh, and so our work at SU is to try and build our relationship with the Chinese churches so that we can better serve them and their young people, children and families. Um, and uh, a rapidly part of the changing landscape is that India has now overtaken China and New Zealand as the, um, the third largest country of birth. That is the fastest growing part of the Australian population is those from Indian origins. And so of another faith group, it's of the Hindu population. They're, they're the largest growing group in the Australian country. I don't know if any of that was a surprise to you. I don't know whether it's your experience um, in where you live and where you shop and where you serve. Um, but that is what we're looking at as the Australian church, both those who are from, um, from uh, an English or a Western European background or those who are not. And, and that's what we're trying to do at SU is serve those churches and their young people better and so increase our missional impact uh, as, a, as a church world, as a church in Australia. So um, this is a photo from some training that I did recently. It was with a Chinese church. They, they were trying to think about cross-cultural engagement and as a part of their mission is they wanted to know how to reach Muslims. So I took a Chinese church to a Bosnian Islamic mosque and here I am a white origin, white Australian from English ancestry and I was finding it quite a weird day to try and think about all the different cultural and otherness dynamics um, but at the end of that day, um, to reflect on what it means to be distinctively Christian, but culturally diverse and vibrantly witnessing to um, the God that loves and knows all people and is at work in our world in ways that we don't understand was quite encouraging. So we would value, I'd value your prayer for that role. And one of my prayers, oh, I, I see a part of, part of the work is to use this resource, which we call CHAT. Uh, CHAT stands for Cultural Hearing, Asking, Telling. It's a bit of the centrepiece of my work and it's part of the, the uh, way that we are looking to resource the church and those who are volunteers or staff with us. Um, and the way that CHAT, if you want to check it out, you can see the website. It's a, uh, a mission that's based on my work in England. So some of you may recall I spent eight years in England working with an SU ministry that worked amongst Muslim, mainly Pakistani young people in Birmingham. Uh, in the UK and based on the mission that we did there we're bringing that approach to witness amongst children and young people here and it's got training it's got a program that we use in schools we're using camps and there's other resources that are coming including a Bible study resource that churches can use in equipping their kids to witness um, to their peers in their schools or in their communities who are of other cultures the the reason why I I think culture is so relevant um, is because I was talking to someone earlier about beach missions. Once upon a time, has anyone here been on a beach mission? So some of you remember beach missions? Good. So beach missions used to be a very prominent part of SU's ministry. Uh, it was where a group of people would go to a beach location and set up a tent or set up a program and go and uh, promote uh, children or youth activities in a caravan park or amongst the people that were holidaying, they would come and then we could tell them about Jesus. That was how Scripture Union started on a beach in North Wales about 150 years ago and it's been happening across the world since. But increasingly in this country, our beach missions are finding that first of all, when they go into the caravan parks or the tented areas, people don't want to come anymore. And that's partly because of child protection, that's partly because I don't know whether I trust the church. But when they do come, they're not responding because the gap has grown so large between us as the Christian community and our Australian population. They're so post-Christian that they don't trust us, they don't want to come to our programs, and when we talk about God, it's just such a, an irrelevant concept. So even normal Australian mission needs to think cross-culturally like we once had to do if we went to Papua New Guinea or if we went to the Middle East 
We know we have to think cross-culturally in another culture outside of our own. Now we need to do that amongst fellow Australians, people in our own neighbourhoods. And so that's why this cross-cultural work radiates out to all of our engagement, our missional engagement with others. So I value your prayer for SU. The, the national merger, it's a really challenging process for um, eight state and territory movements to merge. Um, we, at, because of various challenges with that merger and because of COVID impacts, we've had a lot of vacancies as an organisation. At certain points, we've had about 200 vacancies out of about 800 positions. So there are a lot of school chaplaincy roles to be filled and there's a lot of organisational roles. So if you feel a calling to serve God in a school setting, then do consider chaplaincy. Or if you know people that would like to serve God, we have a lot of vacancies. But we also have key roles in our organisation that are here in Queensland, but also around the country. And we'd value your prayers for those positions being filled by God's people. Um, I am on the verge of being able to grow my cross-cultural ministry nationally, so be appointing some new staff. So I value prayer for those people to be added who are going to be prophetic, ideally, um, non-white voices uh, across our movement. We're praying for God to raise up people to speak into our organisation and to serve us and enable us to serve more broadly. Um, I'd love your prayer for the multicultural church. Um, there are a lot of churches that um, are in houses, in communities, around... I mean, you guys in, in this part of the southern end of Brisbane into Logan, there, there's a lot more in this community than there are elsewhere. But increasingly, I was in Adelaide recently and they were talking about finding these churches that were off the radar. They weren't on any contact list, they weren't on any website, but there were African and um, Indigenous and uh, even Eastern European churches that they found across Adelaide just by relationships and following um, conversations and people. So really pray for that part of the Australian church, that they would feel safe, that they would have uh, a place to play in the Australian community. Um, and that they could be uh, joining us in witness to all people who call Australia home. Um, and also to pray for the depth and breadth of mission in our Australian landscape. It is changing. It is becoming harder. Um, opportunities and challenges are facing mission to reach kids and their families for Christ. So SU would covet your prayer and the way we work with the church would be a wonderful thing um, that we'd appreciate. Um, second hat. My second hat that I'd like to share about is Dumaji. Um, now, I knew that Alan was unwell because last Sunday I was trying to find someone to speak in our church about Dumaji and about Indigenous work and he said, I can't come, I've got a good reason because he was otherwise disposed in, in hospital. Um, so I have just recently joined the Dumaji Inc. board with Alan um, and I did that because I grew up in Dumaji. This was... Um, where I lived until I was the age of 10. Does everyone know where Dumaji is? I'm not just checking, you do know. So Dumaji is the northwestern corner of the state of Queensland. It's further from here to Dumaji than it is from here to Melbourne. Um, but that was where I spent my first 10 years and I didn't overlap with Alan. He came a couple of years later. Um, but I have a very treasured um, memory of growing up in this um, remote indigenous community. My parents were there, dad went as a teacher, mum went as a nurse. Um, they left because of me. My joke is that because my education was suffering and because of the change in our family, we, we, we left. But it still is has a big part of my heart. And I'm really grateful for the chance to rejoin Dumaji Inc. and somehow serve in that space. Um, this is the church, the chapel in Dumaji, the most um, remote uh, church of our family of churches called Dumaji uh, Gospel Hall, I think it is. I'm not sure what name it goes by, Dumaji Gospel Hall. But there's about 30 people who worship there every Sunday, and they are led by Guy and Cecilia Douglas on the left. And um, the, the previous leadership of the church was Doug and Faye Jones. They now live in, in Burktown, but they still support and encourage the work of the church in Dumaji. But it's Guy and Cecilia um, who are the main people who lead that church. And to, to be praying for Dumaji, um, with its unique opportunities and challenges. Um, at the moment, um, they have got seven or eight funerals that they will need to do in the next couple of weeks. Um, now, that is desperately sad to be in a community that's only, only 1,500 people, but to have that many funerals that they're holding. And in Indigenous culture, funerals are a very big, a big affair. Um, but as um, Doug and, and Faye and Guy and Cecilia would say, it's not only... Um, a desperately sad time to be burying their, their people, but it's a chance for them to share the gospel. 
that they would love our prayers for them through even those difficult seasons of the loss of their people. Um, it is a community that needs Jesus, no, no doubt about it. It's a community that has bad press um, often. Uh, it's a small church and a church that faces uh, different challenges than we do down here. But um, please do lift up Guy and Cecilia in your prayers. Um, the reason why I mention it is Dumaji is a special place for me, but it's also forming a part of our SU ministry. So we're praying at SU how we can nurture God's work up there using our resources, including potentially unique school chaplaincy in that community. Uh, we now have an Indigenous chaplain in Bamaka, the top of Cape York, uh, Uncle Iris, um, and we're praying about how to have chaplains like um, in godly indigenous men and women who can serve in places like Dumaji. But in addition to Dumaji and the Gulf Country churches and communities, we're looking to work with a number of Christian conventions. So Catherine is the Christian convention on the top photo and the Rivers Convention, which some of you may have heard about, AMT organised a group to go out to Bawarana and northwest New South Wales. And so next year at Easter, if you would like to go um, to experience indigenous culture, to see God's work amongst the indigenous church, um, can I encourage you to consider going on an Indigenous convention? So um, I'd specifically like to invite you. SU is going to be doing a, a particular piece of work with the Catherine Convention in Northern Territory. So if you are a, one of those people that ends up in a caravan in the outback in that time of year, May long weekend, we would love to host you in Catherine to see and enjoy the fellowship of Indigenous Christians worshipping God and making the good news known. And if you're closer to home, if you want to only go 8 to 12 hours away rather than 24 or whatever it is to get to Dumaji, I uh, get to um, Catherine, um, the uh, AMT will be organising another group to go out and enjoy uh, fellowship with the Christians out in Brewarana and Dubbo uh, at the Easter Convention. So the thing that they're beautiful about these events is that you're not coming and uh, being an extra to the community, you're enjoying seeing them vibrantly serving their community and seeing God work. Um, and I'd love to see more of us in the urban setting to gain a different perspective on the Indigenous community and its churches uh, through these conventions. Uh, I'm not promoting the Gulf Country Convention yet because Guy is thinking it may not run or they may not be a part of it. So in future, there is a Gulf Country Convention that we'd love to promote. But if you're looking to go into a very cross-cultural experience in a remote part of Australia, we'd love you to join us and, uh, and to go and do that. So that's the second hat. The first hat was SU. The second hat was Dumaji. The third hat is Triple C Ost. Does anyone know what Triple C Ost is? Few hands. So Triple C Ost stands for Christian Community Churches Australia. And it is the old... Uh, open Brethren denomination, rearranged as a service arm for our churches. So um, the the churches, uh, there's about 50 of them in Queensland. Uh, there are what I call old Open Brethren or the originals. Um, there's about 43 in this state that are of that background. There's three that are Polynesian churches, two here in Logan and one in Ipswich. And there's one that's Indigenous, that's Dumaji. Um, so 50 churches that are of a community of churches. That's not every old brethren church. There are some that have chosen not to be a part of this loose family of churches. Um, but uh, and we also have four that have been added. Three are Grace churches. One you may know of is a Grace Bible church down here in Springwood, I think, in Logan. And I think they've had some connection with the elders here. Uh, there's also one in Holland Park. There's one in uh, Corinda, which is now in the old brethren church that was there, the Corinda Assembly. And there's another one in Alex Hills called Cornerstone. Um, so my, my, for my sins, I, uh, <laughs> I offered to do a role with Triple C Ost. Um, I was uh, eager to see this network do something other than just have a board meeting that met. And so I have started a day a week with that network um, to nurture a bit of connection. So it's a bit of a vast network. This is a bit of a map to show you. There's one in the Gulf Country. Um, and the numbers down the side are the numbers of people who worship in those areas. North and far north Queensland, there's five churches. Uh, Central Queensland, there's four. Um, nine in the Wide Bay, nine in the Sunshine Coast, three Darling Downs, two the Gold Coast. But the biggest number are here in Brisbane. And um, so my role is to try and nurture some connection between those churches. And that's why I mentioned Dumaji, is it's our remote, most remote in our family of churches. And we really don't want them to feel left out. We want to support them and care for them and to see their ministry thrive in any ways that we can. Um, 
And some of the ways that we're doing that is today, there's a group of us meeting to talk about youth and young adults work, and I'm grateful for Richard coming in with a couple from here. Um, uh, a heads up that we're going to have an elders gathering on the 20th of August, and there's a combined church service. The next one will be at, at Mueller on the 11th of September. Um, I was talking to Trevor about this, is that um, historically our church has thrived when our youth um, got together. So there were old uh, young adult gatherings at our, at our churches in the, I, I'm cautious about saying when it was, but I certainly know the 70s and 80s were where, when it was really strong. But those combined church gatherings were a big feature that saw our churches thrive and also CYC, particularly Burley, but also Pialba, were wonderful ways in which young people cut their teeth in ministry. A lot of us got our first opportunity to be a leader and to influence ministry through CYC. And so today um, we're getting together to think about that and our combined services. And I'd love to see um, maybe one of the smaller expressions of these combined services even come to our smaller services, uh, smaller um, buildings in our churches, because the, the last one that we held in, um, in Village Ave would have had just over 200 people at it. So it was quite a big gathering and we're hoping that Mueller's will be even bigger. So it's a really encouraging time uh, and we value prayer. So that's a bit of an update of my three hats. Love to chat to you if you want to know more about any of those. But can we have a look at the book of Ruth? Um, I find the book of Ruth a fascinating story, um, but not just of the person of Ruth, but of three remarkable people. Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. Um, I will read a couple of passages through it, but we're going to do a bit of a skim through the overall story. Some of you may be very familiar with the overall story, but we're going to have a fly through as a summary to remember this story of these three remarkable people. So at the start of this story, we find uh, Elimelech, who was a, uh, a man in the town of Bethlehem with his wife, Naomi, and two sons. Um, they were poor. So poor that when the famine hit their land, they had to become refugees. So let's have a look at the first couple of verses. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah, together with his wife and two sons, went to live for a while in the country of Moab, which is directly east of where they were, in modern-day Jordan. The man's name was Elimelech, and his wife's name was Naomi, and the names of their two sons were Marlon and Kilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem, Judah. So clearly they were poorer than the average because other people in Bethlehem were able to stay. So their prop property was large enough to sustain them. But we have this poor little family that reached such desperate stakes that either they sold their land or gave their land to someone else. They weren't able to manage it and had to become refugees in a foreign land. So pretty desperate times even for them. Um, I don't know what, whether there was a way they could have stayed. I've tried to think that we know later in the story that there was ways that they could have laboured on someone else's property, but whether it was because of the shame of being poor, whether there was other reasons, but they went and relocated their family because of their desperate times. And then the times became even harder because we find from verse 3, now Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died and she was left with two, her two sons. They married Moabite women, one named Orpha and the other Ruth. After they had lived about there about 10 years, both Marlon and Kilion also died and Naomi was left without her two sons and her husband. So Naomi's circumstances at the start of this story are pretty difficult. She had not only been poor in her homeland, she had become a refugee to a foreign land in order to survive. Um, she then had the joy of seeing her two sons married, but then her husband and her two sons died and she was left with uh, nothing except her daughters-in-law. So as the story goes on, we find that um, the famine had finished in Bethlehem, so she decided to return to her homeland in the hope that she could be amongst her people again and the famine would be uh, and the circumstances and the prosperity would have returned so that she could have lived um, uh, a secure life back there. But going back meant um, 
what did she do with her daughters-in-law? So they were packing up, they were preparing to go, the two girls were preparing to go with her, but she said to them, listen, I'm not going to be able to provide you more husbands. That's what culturally was sort of an expectation to keep the family alive. So why don't you stay and start a new life here? My life is over, my life is finished, but you can go back to your mother's home, you can go back to your family and have another chance. One of the girls did take that opportunity. She did go back to her home in the hope that she could restart life, even though she was a widow, that maybe she could marry again. But when um, we find this remarkable young lady, Ruth, resisted that and said no. And the the verses in verses 16 to 18 are probably some of the best-known verses uh, in the Old Testament, certainly the best-known verses in this book. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or go back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you, if even death separates you and me. So even though given release, even though looking at the option of staying in her homeland, a place that was familiar, around family that were like her, to try and restart life, or go back with this old woman to a land that she was going to be a foreigner in, where they had no property, where she was going to be even more of an outsider, she chose the selfless act, the act that was for the betterment of Naomi, is to return. And then the really sad, probably the saddest part of the book is when Naomi is welcomed back by the people of Bethlehem, her extended family essentially, she says, don't call, this is in verse 20 of chapter 1, don't call me Naomi, she told them, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi? The Lord has afflicted me. The Almighty has brought misfortune upon me. So returning, sad, empty, um, broken, and in a very dark place. That was Naomi's story um, on the start of this book where all she had was a faithful daughter-in-law who cared for her. The story then goes in this incredible way that we, we, we know in Scripture where God's hand was clearly part of it all because Naomi and Ruth came back. They had no income. There was no welfare. The only thing they could do is beg. And so in the Jewish law, there was this provision to be able to go and glean in other people's fields. And so Ruth said, I'll go out and beg. I'll go and work in the harvest fields to try and find some food to keep us alive. And Naomi said, great, you go. And the place that she happened to go to was the farm of a man called Boaz. And Boaz was an extended relative of hers. Um, and Boaz saw this young woman. And because he'd heard about how she had been kind to her mother-in-law, he showed kindness to her. He said to his workers, protect her. Now, clearly, there was danger in going and being a, a gleaner, a, a, a beggar, in these fields because he had to tell his workers to keep her safe, allow her to come and have a drink of your water. Um, so he extended kindness to her as she was out there um, working um, as, a, uh, as, a, as a poor person, as a pauper um, in Boaz's field. Um, this happened for a while through the whole harvest season. Um, Boaz was kind to her and she brought food home and was able to sustain uh, herself and Ruth and, and Naomi. But then Naomi gets this idea Maybe it was because the end of the harvest season was coming up. Maybe they'd been back long enough that Naomi thought, you know, I, I've got to try and help us out or help Ruth out. So Naomi comes up with this idea, harebrained perhaps. Why don't you go and try and... Now, I don't know how to talk about this because it's rather, it's rather a, a weird dating story. Chapter 3 of Naomi, of Ruth, is, a, is a, probably not a conventional way that you'd start a normal relationship. But uh, Naomi says, why don't you go and sh in the, the quiet of the night, <laughs> um, beautify yourself. And uh, as uh, Boaz has finished the threshing and the threshing floor and as he's gone to sleep, why don't you go and lie at the end of his feet? And that act was something about, um, I don't know whether it was uh, highlighting that you know, that she was interested in a relationship, whether it was an act of grace towards him being a bachelor. Um, but he 
realised that it was an act of kindness even to him, a risky act because he could have rejected her. He'd obviously known her through the whole harvest season. They, it wasn't like it had happened just immediately after meeting. Um, but she went and did this act, a risky act that Naomi said in order to try and, and, and give you a, a new chance of, of a partner, of a, of a husband, and of someone who's in our family. And Boaz acknowledged that it was that. It was a risky act that he accepted the offer and then started a process of acting as her kindred redeemer a redeemer who could restore the honour of her family line. So then we find um, in chapter 4, uh, Boaz takes this series of actions to call together some elders to offer to buy Elimelech and his son's land to redeem it, but the, the closer relative had to be given the chance first. He accepted the offer, but then was told that with accepting the land, he had to take a new wife. And he, he said no, because it would have threatened his estate, because the offer to purchase that land came with cultural and lineage complications. And he said no, so Boaz was willing to take that risk. And he took on Elimelech's land, he took on his wife. And the beautiful part at the end of the story, if we read chapter 4, verse 16, we find a very different Naomi because um, through this risky act of being redemption, being his stepping up as a redeemer, he restored Naomi and Ruth culturally into the community. He married um, Ruth and they had a son. And in verse 16, it says, Naomi took the child in her arms and cared for him. The woman, women living there said, Naomi has a son and they named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Mara, God has, has forgotten me through to having a child in her arms and praising God for his restoration culturally, practically, economically of um, this family through these series of events. Now, I just want to highlight some of the things that make this story pop a little bit more. The first verse says, in the days of the judges, I'm not sure how long ago it was that you read the book of Judges, but I find the book of Judges some of the most depressing writing in scripture, especially the last couple of chapters. It is a downward spiral of God's people, a downward spiral into idolatry, into idol worship, into um, living for themselves. And the last couple of chapters are these fairly disgusting stories of God's people um, thinking for themselves. The very last verses of Judges chapter, chapter 21, the very last verses of the book of Judges says, in those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. This was a selfish, self-seeking, dark, godless time. And in the midst of those times we find three remarkable people that were selfless. They were the opposite of thinking for themselves. The end of Judges said, Everyone did as they saw fit. Because in this story of Ruth, we find Naomi, Ruth and Boaz all thought of what the other person needed. So the remarkable thing is this story is set in a time of darkness, a time of great selfishness. And the other thing is it's set in a time where cultural norms were a heavy burden. The cultural norms of family and lineage and ancestry were as valuable as economics. And in this country, in this culture, we may not understand that as much as, as, um, as would be the case in other cultures and certainly in this Middle Eastern culture. Um, but the cultural norms then required transactions and offerings and risks that were of great cost, of great risk. So in this story, we find people trying to work out how to do something selfless, and I would almost call it selfless love. We found Ruth's selfless love for Naomi, love that said, I will commit to you, my mother-in-law, over my own people, my own mother, my own land, because I want you to be well. And even if it meant less for Ruth, she still committed to make Naomi's people her people, Naomi's God her God. We find the selfless love of Boaz, as he wanted to not only restore the well-being of Ruth, but also um, uh, Naomi and even Elimelech. 
by being willing to step up into this costly role as the Redeemer. Um, we find that it was love that took risks. It was risks that by coming back, would Naomi and Ruth be able to survive or would they still be destitute? It was a time when Ruth had to be a forager in a, foreign, in a, in a field begging for food. It was a risk where um, uh, Ruth had to go and take Naomi's crazy idea and seek redemption from Boaz and it could have been rejection. Uh, and it was a risk that Boaz would offer to be that redeemer, knowing that someone else could claim Ruth, could claim Elimelech's land and Naomi and that lineage. And it was love that put others first. It was love that put the person that was other as important as me. And I think the thing that strikes me about this is that selfless love is the only thing that makes a difference in our world. And it's a selfless love that is at the very heart of what it means to be followers of God. It's a love that transforms a broken woman by the self-appointed name of Mara into a woman that could have a child in her arms that not only did it restore her in the immediacy, it, it restored her in history. That through that, these series of selfless events... Naomi and Ruth became ancestors of not only the King of Israel, the first King of Israel, but also our Saviour, our Messiah. Um, it was a, a love that took the most outside of the most marginalised and made them whole. And it's a love that we only find in our Saviour. It's a love that we're going to remember through the selfless act um, in communion after morning tea. If I can turn you to... Uh, a passage in Ephesians, uh, Philippians. Um, this week, um, you might have seen uh, some satellite photos come out from a new famous satellite called the James Webb, I think it is. And these are some of the stars, some of the beautiful photos that have just been released by NASA from these new um, uh, satellite photos. But if I can read some verses as we turn our hearts in preparation for later to the most selfless one. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 from verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself, not looking for your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself to become obedient to death, even death on a cross. Selflessness is a trait that we, the church, those of us that love Christ, want to serve Christ, want to be God's hands and feet in our world, that act of following our Saviour's selflessness is our call as Christians. It's the only thing that will make us difference. It's not going to come down to how clever our service is, how smart our organisation is, and how wealthy we are. It comes down to this heart that we have after our Saviour who laid down his life. And as a result of that uh, verse, in verses 14 and 16 we have of Philippians, we have... Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. And that is certainly what we have today. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. So I have the privilege of serving in a number of missional settings in trying to serve with Scripture Union as we reach out to children, young people and families with the good news of Jesus in seeing God's work happen and thrive in the Dumaji community and Indigenous communities around Australia and across our churches. But the thing that will be um, the difference maker is not how clever those organisations are, not how smart I am, but it comes down from our Saviour who works through us in selfless love to our world. And as being selfless, we stand out better than any stars in our universe do as we are made in God's image. We can be his image bearers in selfless love. So I'm going to uh, uh, pray for us that we would um, seek that selflessness like Ruth did, like Naomi demonstrated and Boaz did um, in our world and in our service. Lord, thank you so much for the chance to remember the selflessness of Jesus. 
Thank you so much for the radical difference that a selfless God is compared to what we know in our world and every other expression of religion, of service, of charity that comes from our human skills and character. Lord, we are undeserving of your selflessness. We're undeserving of your grace. And I pray, Lord, that you might transform your church and and us and each of us and as a church here with this heart that we model on, that we seek from, that we are able to have through your Holy Spirit that is the same heart of Christ that transforms brokenness to wholeness, that gives back to those that have lost everything because only you are the one who saves. Lord, I pray that you'd bless this church and bless the ministries of SU, the Dumaji Chapel today, and our movement of churches. And I thank you so much for the privilege to join with you today. In Jesus' name, amen.